Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, the purpose of today's forum is to debrief on the whiteboarding session um, with CMS that was held on January 22nd in Baltimore. I am Marjorie Rollins, Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer for PCPI, and joining me today are a number of our colleagues. Um, some of our colleagues that will be speaking today are Samantha Tierney, who is the a senior director for measurement science, um, Crystal Price, the associate director for registry programs, Deborah um, Harper, who is the program manager in our testing area. Um, we also have uh, Alvia Chavarria, who uh, leads our measurement um, science program as well as our measure development program, and Neha Agrawal as well. And also on the phone is Virginia Rio, who is an advisor and consultant uh, to PCPI. For uh, today's agenda, we'll begin with a brief recap on the meeting and then delve more deeply into uh, measure testing and to MVPs. And then we'll end um, with uh, next steps. So let's start with uh, housekeeping. Sounds like many are joining. Good. Um, this forum is being recorded, and all lines will be muted until we have the open discussion. Please mute, mute your line uh, unless you are speaking. And most importantly, please feel free to speak up, because that is the purpose of this forum, is to be heard and to share your thoughts and your ideas. Okay, next slide. So uh, let's begin with a brief recap of the meeting. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Okay, thank you for that information. So that session uh, was held in collaboration with PCRC, the Physician Clinical Registry Coalition that is headed up by Rob Portman, and CMSS that is led by Helen Burstyn. There were essentially four topics pre-submission audits, composite measures as it relates to the measure selection criteria, the testing requirements that we're all familiar with for QCDRs, and uh, MIPS value pathways. In terms of pre-submission audits, the key takeaways are that the timing of requirements are prob problematic, and the amount of data and the actual nature of the data needed for audit is problematic as well. And there is no clear-cut path on um, pre-submission audits and how to resolve them. PCRC led that discussion and will continue to lead those discussions um, with CMS on those issues. Uh, we also brought the topic of composite measures to CMS's attention because we know that there is a strong preference for composite measures by CMS or to, and there's also a preference by CMS to combine measures um, in, a te in an attempt um, from their perspective to make measures more meaningful. We do know, however, that there is um, underlying methodology and science to combining um, measures and to composite measures. And our goal for having that discussion with CMS was to bring those issues to their attention. And what I'd like to do is to um, turn things over to uh, Samantha Tierney just to share some highlights of what we brought um, to their attention. Sure. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, so just to add a little bit to what Marjorie said, you know, we <clears throat> understand there's been this tendency on the part of CMS to prefer um, measures that are either true composite measures where there's one overall score or very complex measures with maybe one denominator and multiple numerator components. So <clears throat> we really wanted to emphasize to CMS that this is, uh, you know, that measurement, it cannot really be, uh, it's, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to measurement and that there is a methodology, as Marjorie mentioned, in science behind trying to combine like measures together and ensuring that the evidence supports that those multiple components together would lead to better outcomes. I would say essentially what we heard from CMS was that 
you know, as Marjorie said, they're trying to raise the bar um, on measures, and this is seen as one way to do that um, for the QCDR program. They did mention that, you know, they understand that, you know, it may not always make sense to lump measures together or to, in maybe some cases, it could be more appropriate to split them out and that they are very open to hearing that and that they would encourage groups feel that that is not in the best interest of the measure to essentially push back on that request and communicate their concerns to them. So we found that to be, you know, encouraging, certainly, and I, I think that that's sort of the take-home message for that composite measure issue. And I'll, and I'll turn it back over to you, Marjorie. Yes, okay. very quickly, because the next item on this list is measure testing, but I think what I'd like to do is reserve that for one discussion, and Crystal, if we could move to the MVPs just to do a brief summary on that, and we'll go into that in more detail as well. But in terms of um, MVPs, we know that the intent is to uh, address the lack of coordination uh, across measures, the improvement activities, and interoperability, and to um, promote alignment. That's one issue that we point that we raised with CMS, and we know that that is uh, their intent, one of their goals for MPPs as well. Um, there's also a need to provide data and feedback to clinicians, particularly on cost measures. And um, we know that promoting interoperability and population health measures um, are intended to be MVP agnostic and serve as a foundation for um, MVPs overall. They cut across all of those areas. And that there is a plan for implementation in 2021. So that's just a brief summary of some of the discussion items that happened at the meeting. We have a more detailed um, discussion later on in on this call today, and we'll we'll uh, we'll have more discussion at that time. So if we could, why don't we move to the measure testing issue? Sam, are you? Yeah, okay. I'm going to start, and I'm going to ask my colleague Deborah to join in. Um, so, you know, we had an initial conversation with CMS in late December um, to talk about, you know, the challenges that the um, the rule and the recommendations put forth in the rule would pose to QCDRs, and that was uh, another collaborative conversation with uh, PCRC and CMSS. <clears throat> and as a result of that discussion, there was agreement that it might be helpful for a smaller group to talk a little bit more in detail about, you know, what testing really means for registries and how the recommendations or CMS's guidance would <clears throat> be operationalized and furthermore the challenges that that would pose. And so Helen at CMSS, Helen Burson, took the lead on creating a document that could um, <clears throat> give CMS some further food for thought and some different alternatives to how to implement the uh, the requirements, especially really in light of the fact that NQF's requirements uh, itself are fairly fluid and they are not um, hard and fast any one methodology. And so there was some, I think, sentiment that maybe we could encourage CMS to consider, uh, you know, some of these challenges and, and adopt a different approach. So outlined here are really what was proposed in that <clears throat> in a two-pager document to CMS to see if there could be some flexibility. And I would say, bottom line, the approach was that was recommended was essentially face validity for all of the measures, whether they be new measures or existing measures, and that there be a grace period for reliability testing, um, and that would vary depending on whether or not it was an existing measure or a new measure. Um, there was also Emphasis that when groups are asked to harmonize measure the measures that that presents its own challenges because the measures are still uh, in a state of flux and therefore could those measures couldn't be expected to be tested according to these timelines and so there was a recommendation put forward for that um, and then <clears throat> some of the other finer points that have that are outlined on this slide and uh, next slide please Crystal. And so CMS's response, and, you know, I, I know probably some of you on the phone were also part of that discussion, 
Um, I think they emphasize really what they outline in the rule. And they, you know, I, I think appreciated the time taken to put together a thoughtful alternative approach. Uh, but they also, you know, emphasize that they are bound by what's in the rule and that the rule <clears throat> really does emphasize that um, testing needs to be done in accordance with the blueprint. Um, which is also aligned with NQF uh, standards. So that is, the, you know, these two top bullet points were pulled from the rule, and I would say that <clears throat> throughout our conversation, our follow-up conversation, that, that this was really um, what CMS emphasized, continued to emphasize that, you know, the, the, this has been stated before and that the rule does say it has to be according to the NQF standards. And, in fact, I would say they also said that they – understand that NQF standards are not hard and firm in terms of re requiring one methodology or having a certain level at which results are considered reliable or valid. And that is, in fact, why, you know, they support the NQF approach because it is somewhat specific to your data availability needs and so on and so forth. There was some conversation, I would say, about the, the fact that there is some confusion because of the, the, you know, just referring to NQF standards alone is not that clear, and that wouldn't necessarily offer great guidance to groups who are trying to test measures because it, of the ambiguity and some of the, um, you know, the, the unique nuances to the NQF criteria. And I would say the follow-up from CMS as it related to that was that they would be happy to clarify what is unclear if, um, you know, if some specifics were provided to them. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Crystal. Um, you know, I, I think just from our perspective, you know, the key takeaways, uh, I would say, is that CMS is still going to require this, and they did emphasize the NQF requirement. Um, we completely understand that there are challenges for QCDRs to meet this requirement, especially from a time consideration and a cost, cost consideration. And to the extent that we can try to help influence CMS as, as uh, this continues to play out, we will. Although <clears throat> they did really, again, emphasize that, that, uh, that they are not, not going to be able to deviate from what was in the rule. So we thought just for the purposes of this conversation today, it may help to, if you go to the next slide, Crystal, just to give you a sense of the NQF testing requirements. And this is our take on them. You know, we've submitted a number of measures to NQF and have a good sense of what's required and what's not required. And so we put this together. It's essentially an interpretation of their requirements because I don't know if we've seen anything that spells it out quite as, clearly. And I would say these are, um, at least for e-measures, it's sort of the minimum requirements. But an NQF, just to be clear, doesn't separate it out quite the way we did here with ECQM versus registry. ECQMs are their own uh, unique type of measure according to the NQF requirements, and they have their own uh, specific testing requirements, which you can see here. Um, but for registry measures, they uh, most of those fall into this sort of other bucket, which is a structure process outcome measure, and that, that NQF requirements for that are clear. But this is how, you know, we've worked to submit registry measures to NQF, and this is how um, we understand the requirements to be. So for new measures um, or existing measures, there really is, and I know this is, a, you know, this was this is mentioned in the blueprint. There's no actual formal tool required to assess feasibility, unlike with an ECQM, where you're required to use the NQF scorecard and it asks some specific questions, um, and you have to do that in two sites with two different EHRs. That really is not a requirement for understanding feasibility for a registry measure. And if you're submitting to NQF, you're really just answering three basic questions about, like, data availability, if it's part of workflow, if it's not, will it eventually be? Some very basic questions. So I would say, um, for those of you who are thinking how to operationalize this, you know, feasibility is a fairly easy uh, 
thing that can be completed, and it's really, I would say, your understanding as the registry steward of how the data is collected, and you could respond to those questions quite easily, I imagine, from your experience understanding how the measure works and how the data is collected. Um, but then if we move to reliability and validity, so there is a, a type of testing called data element level testing, and Deborah can explain a little bit more about what that includes. And um, if you conducted that type of testing, that meets both the requirements for reliability and validity. We have that little asterisk there, and according to NQF requirements, they say no reliability testing is required if data element validity testing is conducted and the results are adequate. So if you were to conduct that type of testing, you really can check both boxes. You've done both of those things. The challenge, I would say, with that type of testing, and we've done it ourselves, is that it's quite resource intensive and costly. And again, I'll have Deborah talk a little bit more and add a little bit more uh, detail to these items in just a bit. And then for, um, if you were to consider an alternative approach and not do data element level, I would say for a new measure, your best bet would be to do face validity testing, which can be conducted through a simple survey of uh, experts who are not involved in the development of the measure and asking them a question about, you know, whether they think the measure accurately differentiates quality among providers on a Likert scale, and then you can report the, the information in, you know, more of a statistical fashion approach. If you were to do that, that would meet your requirements for validity, but you would need reliability testing. And so typically, um, and I would say for us, what we've done in the past mostly is score level reliability testing where we do a signal to noise analysis that Deborah will probably go into a little bit more in a minute here. Um, the one kind of unique notion with an existing measure is that, at least according to NQF requirements, for any measure that had already been endorsed and then is up for re-endorsement, there's an expectation that at that time you would have empirical validity testing and not just face validity testing. But they do have a little loophole where they say they would accept face validity testing if you could provide justification. So that's something to be aware of. Um, I would say that uh, one question I have, and I think something we would hope to get more clarity from CMS on, is that it's very clear from an NQF process whether you're submitting a new or existing measure. If the measure's never been endorsed, it's new. If it was endorsed before and it's up for its three-year maintenance cycle, it's existing. But one thing I'm not sure of from a CMS perspective is what is considered a new measure versus an existing measure um, because, you know, I think we just want to have some definitions around that because even NQF allows you three years to gather data to consider a measure, an existing measure, and then therefore to demonstrate the empirical validity testing. So that, I think, is a point worth further discussion with CMS. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to see if Deborah would like to add any more, uh, as Marjorie likes to call it, color commentary to what I said and any more details on the testing approaches, if we have time. I'm looking at Crystal because she's looking at me. Um, <laughs> and if not, Deborah, feel free to add a little more, and then I don't know, are we waiting for questions at the end? No, we're going to go ahead and discuss um, measure testing now before we move on to it. Okay. Actually, that question that came up, I think, might be more interesting is to address really quickly before adding any detail. And so there's time to add detail, but I think that was a really good um, question. The something to the Karen brought up. Oh, I thought. Oh, yeah. So Karen Davidson asked, um, as we discussed previously, um, there's no differentiation uh, between QCDR measures and ECQNs, and that's what's most confusing. So, Karen, this is Sam. I, I actually think um, in, in this case, uh, it's better if your measure is considered a registry measure. And um, oftentimes, even if we're working with groups who maybe have a separate ECQM, but they also use it in a registry, uh, those measures are usually considered registry measures for purposes of submitting to NQS. There's not, there hasn't been, um, I would say, a clear distinction 
at NQF about, you know, a registry that maybe relies on electronic data versus a registry that may rely on claims data. Registry measures are registry measures regardless of the uh, data source or where they get most of their data. So I would say uh, that I would consider your measures, if it's a QCDR measure, a registry measure, and you could make a good case to say that it is a registry measure and therefore you would adhere to the NQF requirements for registry measures. I don't know if that helps. I know, I think you're on mute, so maybe you can type a response or we can circle back to that. Yeah. I'm going to unmute everyone. Okay. In preparation for the discussion, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll do it a little bit more. So All guests have been unmuted. I saw that, so that was really good just so we understand, like, why I'm, I'm going to, if everybody can make sure they're on mute, why I'm going to go in and talk about a couple of these more in detail um, as far as the registry testing and how we would go about that here. Uh, so when you're doing feasibility at a registry level, there is um, not an NQS scorecard, but there are three questions that are put forth that need to be addressed. Um, and these are whether required data elements are routinely generated and used during care delivery, whether required data elements are available in EHR or other electronic sources or a credible near-term path to electronic collection that's specified, and the demonstration that data collection strategy can be implemented. So, you know, it, it's a little bit flexible in how you decide to collect that data, but you do need to still collect the data element, but that flexibility of not having a scorecard is it might be a little bit helpful in reducing a little bit of the burden um, in answering those three questions. And as far as validity testing goes, you know, that the standard that, you know, NQS hopes for is data element, um, which we know is intensive. And at a minimum, you can report from the numerator, denominator, and exclusions or exceptions. Um, so, you know, if it's not at the data element, you can actually have a little bit of a rolled up assessment as well. So what we do here um, is that we would have at least two sites that would use two different EHRs. We collect the state data collection forms in-house that we give to the site, and we first ask them to electronically pull data on a sample of states that's relevant to this population, and then we take that sample population and we give it to a set of abstractors who will manually uh, extract the measure, and then we do an iterator agreement to calculate Cohen's kappa. So you can imagine this will vary of level of effort depending on how many elements that you have that need to be tested and whether it makes sense to test at a slightly higher level. Um, for face validity, uh, we would go and find practitioners or other healthcare professional, professionals who are knowledgeable in the substantive areas of a given measure. And then we give them an overview of the measure intent and the definitions of the measure. They are then administered a survey that we use to rate their level of agreement as Sam has said on a Likert scale. So we can report the percent agreement among the population. And then empirical validity would be completed at a score level. So if you have a lot of data, this is actually a little bit of a, a faster method than phase validity in that you can do a correlation analysis of the score between the measure that's in testing and a related measure at the provider level. So if you actually have data on another uh, measure that is similar, you can go this route. For reliability, um, when we don't have data element testing, we would look at score level testing using signal to noise analysis. And this is to measure the proportion of variation in the performance scores due to systemic, excuse me, systematic differences across the measured entities in relation to random error. Um, you want this sample to represent the variety of entities whose performance will be measured. So it wants, you want a kind of a representative uh, sample of people in this testing. And I wanted to point out that um, there's potential for use of existing uh, testing data at data element level. So this is actually in the um, NQF measure evaluation criteria and guidance for evaluating measures for endorsement that was published in 2019. Prior evidence of reliability of data elements for the data type specified in the measure, uh, e.g. hospital claims, can be used as evidence for those data elements. Prior evidence could include published or unpublished testing that includes the same data elements, uses the same data type, and is conducted. And that's kind of the extra detail I have, so I'll pass it back to you, Tim. 
Yeah, I think, uh, Crystal, we can probably entertain a question or two, right? Yes. Um, many of your lines are unmuted. Um, if you find that we don't hear you, please just type in the chat window. Um, if you have questions outright, you can go ahead and get started. We have about 10 more, 10 more minutes for questions. I'll ask Karen, since um, you had asked that question earlier, did my response make sense to you, or did you have any additional follow-up? Hi, Sam. It makes total sense, and I agree with you. I just wish CMS would clearly state that they are accepting registry-level testing. But that's fine. Yeah, but I think, so I, I, I think, you know, of course, more clarity would be uh, welcome, right? Because, you know, then you know exactly how they might interpret information you provide. But I also think that if they said they are testing, they are going to require testing according to the NQF standards, uh, the NQF standard for registry measures is different than ECQM. And so as long as you can show that you've tested the measures according to the registry standards defined by NQF, then you've met what you're, you know, you're, expect, you're expect, expected to meet in terms of their requirements. But I, I agree, like, of course, more clarity is needed. And that's probably something we can, you know, work on further with, um, you know, a collaborative group, but, uh, and especially around this issue of what constitutes a new measure versus an existing measure, because if they're, again, going by NQF requirements, an existing measure has been around for three years or more. Um, so I think certainly more clarity is needed, but uh, I think you could, you would, have reason to make a good argument if you tested according to the NQF requirements and says what they're saying they are expected. We have another question from Corinne Rubin. Um, even in the MIPS program, doesn't CMS treat QCR measures as registry measures when creating the benchmark? If so, should we be referring to CMS to that definition for consistency? Yeah, I mean, I think Corinne, great point. I think that's something uh, that, you know, the QCDR stewards points here to further emphasize why they tested according to the registry standards. This is Corinne, so, yeah. and also to, chime, to chime in and what Sam is saying, I wholeheartedly agree and I believe there's an argument to be made um, on the, the registry and keeping with, uh, with the NQF standards. Um, and um, I think the other thing I think people haven't totally thought about is CMS, CMS real, at the end of the day, I know more clarity is helpful, um, but knowing that the timeline is ticking and things have to get moving. I don't, you know, does CMS really plan on going in the weeds and looking at all this testing data? I mean, they're going to get hundreds of measures that they suppose we might have to look at by September if they don't budge on, on the deadline. And so I I think at this point in time, some of the vagueness can actually work in people's favor. I think they just want to see testing regardless of really the structure of that testing, it seems like. Because they don't know what they want need. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Corinne. I see there's a question about uh, CMS's stance on face validity. So I, I will tell you what my takeaway was. You know, I think that um, there was this proposal to only have face validity be the testing, at least in the short term, and CMS very, very clearly said that is not going to cut it. Uh, you know, we do expect some reliability testing. They did also emphasize that they would adhere to the NQF requirements, which to me means face validity for new, new measures is okay. Um, and face validity for existing measures may be okay with justification, but I don't know how much I would count on that. I mean, they did mention that they, they said they would uh, 
review things on a case by case basis and that people could have conversations with them. Uh, and there was, in fact, someone from the scientific methods panel at NQF uh, who worked at one of the societies who said, like, that is that is what NQF does. I've been part of it. They they consider things on a case by case basis, and that you can provide an exception as to why you couldn't provide empirical validity testing. So I think very clearly, face validity is okay for new measures. It may be okay for existing measures, and that I, I would say that's sort of the takeaway. Another question. Another question. I can't read that right now. There are four criteria for evaluation of a measure for NQF. Will we be required to include importance and usability? Is CMS including these two aspects as part of testing for Mary Beth Farquhar? So my sense is, um, and even actually, so if you go back to the slide where we CMS's rule. Yep. If you look at this, it's really only focused on completed testing results as defined by the blueprint. So my interpretation of this is that they will not be looking at the other NQF criteria, and they even go on to say we don't require QCDR measures to be NQF endorsed for use in the program. So uh, I don't think that their intent, at least as they stated it, of course, you know, I'm not a mind reader, so I'm just interpreting their language. Um, but because this is so focused on testing and testing according to the blueprint, it is my sense that they will only look at the testing criteria, at, you know, that NQF puts forward, so validity, uh, reliability, and feasibility. Although, as I've said, feasibility is not uh, it's more through attestation right now for NQF requirements for a registry measure than any other format. And we have our last question here before we need to move on. Uh, to clarify, facility for validity testing plus some form of reliability testing may be acceptable, assuming they consider all QCDR measures as new measures, since this is the first year of testing requirements. That's also from Tracy. Yeah, so I would say yes, face validity plus some form of reliability testing will may be acceptable. For new measures, for sure, that should be enough. For existing measures, you're going to have to make a case as to why you couldn't get um, get empirical validity, but it seems like they were sort of implying that may be uh, uh, appropriate and they would consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. So I know that's a little wishy-washy of an answer. But only because I, I don't know how they're, they, they kind of gave a wishy-washy answer themselves that they would consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. But one follow-up, I think, to this conversation is that maybe um, we can work and follow up with CMS uh, and maybe with CMSS and CCRC to understand what is the definition of a new measure versus an existing measure for purposes of them applying the NQF criteria because NQF has that well defined, but I don't think CMS does as of yet. So I think that's it, Crystal. Fun conversation on testing. If you ever, if you have any follow-up, feel free to contact me or Deborah at the CCPI and we're going to move on to the next item, right? Thanks, Sam. So many of you should have uh, received um, a notification that we opened a survey this uh, past week about uh, NIPS value pathways. And uh, I'm just going to share some of the responses from our survey, and then we'll have another open discussion uh, to talk a little bit more in depth about MVPs. So um, when we asked people um, what's their overall level of concern about MVPs, the general consensus is that people are very concerned or concerned about MVPs. Um, thus far, we have 23 respondents, and uh, that will be the, the basis for most of these survey responses. And I do want to clarify that we've actually left the, uh, the survey open for another week. So if you have an opportunity uh, after this call, uh, please go in and fill in the survey. It's pretty short. Um, and we're just trying to get a general feel of where people are in the process of thinking about MVPs. So will your clinicians report using MVPs? Uh, many are still undecided. Um, 
Some said that they will not report using MVPs. Uh, we should have asked a follow-up question to say whether people are um, jumping to APMs or uh, remaining in MIPS, but um, that's something we certainly will want to follow up on um, in the near future to better understand exactly uh, how people plan to engage in MVPs. So what's the um, greatest concern? Um, there was a lot of information uh, provided here about the uh, concerns around um, this value pathways. And uh, one of the largest um, components of this that came up is uh, clinician burden. Um, also, whether there are going to be measures um, available for um, specialties and subspecialties. We do understand that those are the biggest concerns, and those are some areas in which we'll seek to work with organizations uh, to figure out how we can make this a uh, successful program uh, for, the, for those that it's going to affect. When we asked what could we do to help, um, the top two answers were really um, surrounding education and advocacy. As we learn more about um, the value pathways, uh, we will be sharing that information with you all. And um, as evidenced by our uh, whiteboarding session in January and our previous exchanges with CMS, um, advocacy is a big deal. Um, we're definitely working uh, with other organizations such as CMS and HCRC as well um, as medical specialty societies and other organizations that participate in the QCR program to really um, work together to advocate for the best way to apply this program um, to QCDRs or, or clinicians that this would be affected by. When asked uh, what stage of preparation is your organization at for MVPs, 60% uh, of the respondents said that they have started preparing for MVPs, which was uh, a very uh, surprising number, to me at least. Um, some have reported that they're well prepared and they have, um, you know, taken this seriously since the, um, the um, issuance of the final rule and um, are well on their way. But um, a quarter of the population um, stated that they haven't started working on MVPs at all. And, We'd like to hear from uh, the general audience here, um, what have you been doing to prepare, and uh, for those that have not prepared, um, what do you believe your next steps will be? Uh, one of the questions or one of the uh, comments that came up during our whiteboard session about MVPs uh, is the need to work together um, to develop um, MVPs that cross specialties or subspecialties, um, whether it's looking at disease states or conditions um, or uh, addressing clinicians from a variety of different specialties. So um, four respondents said that they are currently working with other specialties or subspecialties. 17 said no, and this also includes, um, this includes respondents that stated that they aren't working or they haven't thought about working, and there was one that didn't answer. One of the major concerns that came up um, was the MVP focus on population health measures. Um, so when asked about this, uh, the responses varied greatly. Um, people have stated that there's not enough information from CMS to be able to make uh, valid decisions. Um, there's opposition to making population health uh, the basis of the program, considering that it affects different clinicians in different geographical areas um, greatly. Again, there's a concern about additional burden. This seemed to be um, at the forefront of all the discussion about um, MVPs, and um, many were unsure of the effect of population health measures on MVPs. Also, some additional concerns are about how this will affect scoring and concerns about this being a repeat of previous programs, um, whether this would be a, uh, going back to a PQRS or a PQRI. And overall, um, the thoughts were varied, but uh, what came to the forefront is that um, many organizations feel as if they have a lack of information and they have a lack of control. Um, CMS will still make MVPs um, with or without specialty input. Major concern about this increasing provider burden. Um, and really understanding what's the goal of this program. Uh, CMS has stated that uh, the program is really intended to uh, reduce burden. 
but uh, many respondents are wondering if this is uh, intended to uh, reduce options available to specialties and subspecialties. Uh, one of the other great concerns was the need for pilot testing before rollout. Uh, it seems as if CMS is uh, sort of playing this by ear and has no intention of holding a true pilot before rolling this out in its entirety. Uh, and again, when asked how PCPI could, could help with this, uh, there were several respondents who said that uh, PCPI could potentially help with the rollout of the program. So we will be exploring uh, ways in which to be um, as useful as possible to um, organizations to ensure that this is going to go smoothly. So with that, I'm going to um, open discussion. If you would please type your questions into the chat window. Um, and Marjorie will help lead our, our discussion on MVPs. And I'll also ask that Virginia Real um, who's been helping uh, PCPI navigate the space of the MVPs um, be included in the discussion. Questions? Any questions outright? Hi, Crystal? Yes. Can you hear me? So, Amy, yes, I can hear Virginia. And Virginia, before I give you the floor, um, we did have one uh, question from the chat. Um, we'd like to know how others have gotten started so far. Um, so, Virginia, I'm going to feed the floor to you, and then if others want to mm -hmm. chime in on how to no. start it. Okay. That was exactly my question that I was going to pose to the group is if your organization has started to prepare for MVPs, what steps have you taken? Yes. So this is Crystal again. Um, my assumption is that the program rollout has been fairly vague thus far, and so um, many are feeling as if they don't know what they don't know. Um, if anyone's willing to uh, either affirm or negate that, or um, if anyone else feels as if they have a really good understanding um, of MVPs, or even just your opinions on the program in general. Um, that helps us help you navigate the program. So this is Marjorie, and I'll just sort of make a comment. I do think that there is some maybe still positing or thinking about what MVPs actually are and what they what actually encompasses an MVP and the conceptual approach to developing one. I, I think that there's still a lot of vagueness around that. Um, I think there is a notion that um, MVPs are developed around a uh, you know a specialty or a domain. Maybe another way to think about them is around a condition or a continuum of care. Those are the types of 
um, you know, comments or thinking that we want to hear from you. And, you know, we're willing to convene these discussions, help you think through those things if you need them, if you need that type of support. So we just had a question that came in. Has any organization met with CMS about this yet? If so, what was the focus of the conversation? So I think we heard from CMS that they have met with um, organizations. That's actually a question that I asked at the January 22nd meeting. This is Marjorie. And um, they didn't have any information that they could share other than, other than that there are organizations that have met with CMS. So are there any organizations that are on the line that would like to ex share their experience if you have met with CMS? All right. It seems as if uh, we still have quite a bit of thinking to do about uh, MIPS Value Pathways. And uh, we certainly plan to convene more discussions like these uh, surrounding MVPs as they unfold and develop. Um, we have approximately 14 minutes left. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to use the remainder of the time to, um, you know, redirect um, our efforts on any other discussion, um, if there's anything else pertaining to measure of testing or MVPs or pre-submission audits um, that you would like to discuss on the line today, uh, we're happy to facilitate that conversation. Hearing no additional commentary, um, I'd like to cover a handful of other things that we have. Oh, we do have a few more questions. So before I move forward, um, the question is, um, has PCPI published its measure testing document yet? Uh, so this is Sam. So you, you remember correctly maybe that we had uh, a measure of testing protocol, essentially, that was in the works um, with our measure advisory committee. Um, however, uh, in recent, I guess, meetings with our measure advisory committee, we were kind of questioning the utility of producing this document and sharing it very broadly. Um, and so we've kind of gone back to the drawing board, if you will, in terms of, of determining next steps with that document. So I would say that we will not be producing anything in the short term. Um, we did actually, uh, my colleague Deborah uh, did help put together some a high level, I guess I would say slides that describe the different types of testing and the, the methods that we have, have followed. And I think we'd be happy to share that. Uh, after this call, I don't know how, but this will, will help me figure out how we can do that. Um, and it does, it starts with the review of the NQF testing requirements, but then it goes through each of the types of testing, feasibility, validity at the data element level, validity at the uh, doing a correlation analysis. And it just describes high level, like how that's done, time frame, data availability concerns. So I think that's something we'd be happy to share. And it may even be more useful for you than the testing protocol, which was like you want like a hundred some pages that probably would feel a lot like the blueprint that might not offer that much really good advice as to how you might uh, proceed with testing. But I will say, you know, we are a membership organization, and so if you're one of our members, 
we'd be happy to have conversations with you to think through how you might test your measures. Um, you know, just as, as a benefit of membership and, and to talk to you about how we've tested our measures and, you know, how we've been able to get them endorsed, which again would therefore imply that met the, the NQF standard requirement for registry measures. So um, we'd be happy to talk to anybody. So I don't, you could feel free to reach out to me um, by email if you want to schedule a call to talk a little bit more about like what your challenges are and we could probably think of different ideas for you to, to test your measures. So our next question uh, is, have any other organizations begun testing their measures? From Suzanne Pope. So while people are seeing up their responses uh, for that, I'll move on to the next question from Jennifer Birch. Uh, as groups meet with CMS regarding MVPs, can PCPI have a repository to share this information with or other organizations? Sure. Yeah, I think that that um, would be uh, a really good resource uh, for other organizations as they are having discussions with CMS and can share some lessons learned and uh, some best practices with how to move forward with MVP. So um, that's something we'll discuss internally. And I think that, um, you know, we'll get back to you to let you know um, how we choose to proceed with that. The next question was, uh, would a webinar devoted to testing be of interest to those on the call? I think we did have something teed up a little bit later um, about uh, measure testing, and it looks as if um, that would be uh, of use for many people on the call. Yeah, we were planning, I don't know what, I suppose you remember the time frame. I mean, we could potentially consider Moving it up, um, just given the concern, you know, given the, the, I guess, the way this all has played out and the, the lack of flexibility that the CMS is affording related to the requirements. So I believe that we were looking to do um, that webinar probably in March. Okay. Um, I think it'll take us until March to kind of get more information together about that. but. Uh, Please stay tuned uh, to our announcement, um, and we will be in contact about um, future webinars, including one on measure testing. Another comment uh, from Laura Vera at AAD. Uh, she said that they have hired a testing vendor for their measure testing project. So, Suzanne, that may be someone to reach out to if you want to understand what other organizations are doing. And I guess I will say, too, you know, we uh, last year we submitted 15 measures to NQF for endorsement, and I would say maybe nine of them were registry measures. Um, two of them in particular were QCDR measures that we supported an organization in doing that work. Um, but, you know, I, I would encourage you all to look at NQF submission forms for measures that are similar to ones that you might want to put forward or measures that at least are the same data source because you could see how people responded to NQF uh, requirements and maybe it might generate some ideas of your own to figure out how to address the new requirements. I mean, I, I personally like looking at other people's submission forms because I think it helps uh, shed some light on just other techniques different groups are, are using or maybe might help validate our technique, that kind of thing. So I would definitely encourage uh, anyone who has some interest in wanting to understand a little bit more details about how measures are tested or uh, how one would even fill out a submission form because it would at least enlighten you as to maybe how you would then respond to CMS as to how the what the results look like once you did your testing and describing the methods a bit better. Bit better. And lastly, um, ASCO is attempting to bring testing in-house with new staff hired to conduct the analysis on in-house data sources. That was from Caitlin Gromelli. So 
So any additional uh, commentary on measure testing or MPP? Okay, um, so upcoming, um, we still have our Mint's Value Pathway Survey that's been extended until next week. Um, I will find the, I will ensure that I get the uh, URL for the survey uh, distributed to this group. Um, we also have another webinar that's upcoming on February 26th, uh, specifically on registry diversification, uh, building the sustainable disease registries to accelerate research and improve lives. So Pulse Info Brain, a PCI member, uh, Dr. Fermita Bobby Shridhar, uh, will be giving a, a webinar and a talk on, on disease registries, um, how to utilize your registry uh, to several different means, not just for uh, reporting purposes, but also uh, for research and quality improvement. And our upcoming meetings uh, include the PCPI AMA PCDR conference uh, on April 28th of this year. And many of the topics that we've been discussing today um, will also, uh, you know, be discussed at our uh, PCDR conference. So please stay tuned for information about that. Um, we've got four more minutes left. Uh, I will uh, see the floor to the team to see if there's any other questions or comments. And if not, I'll give um, people the rest of their day back. Anything else from the team? Just to my head, um, I received a, an email last night saying that CMS was actually hosting a webinar on Wednesday, February 12th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on an overview of MVPs and answering any questions. Um, so I actually tried to register for it this morning. So this is like less. 12 hours after I received the email, and it's completely full, and I received a reply um, after I inquired about, you know, adding lines or adding another session, and they said, no, you know, no, the recording will just be available within a couple of weeks of, of the session. So just as an FYI, it might be a moot point now, but um, that is there for at least you to access the recording of. Thanks, Neha. If there's no other questions or comments, um, we will be posting this um, on our website soon. Um, and if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to contact us at info at the PCPI .org. Thank you.